Welcome to CBL's Rich Heritage. Our guests today are Dr. Vic Kennedy and his wife, Deborah. Dr. Kennedy is an emeritus professor with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, where he's performed ecological research in the Chesapeake Bay and taught graduate students. He has also participated in research in New Zealand and Canada. His recent research interests include the ecosystem effects of introduced aquatic species and the potential effects of global climate change on marine ecosystems. He's published 60 plus papers in peer reviewed science journals and written numerous chapters in books and scientific proceedings. Deborah Kennedy is an artist of the Eastern Shore, recognized as a shore artist whose work highlights an element of regional life. She earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in graphics and painting at Miami University in Ohio. In addition to her paintings, she has worked as a biological illustrator with the Smithsonian and a number of marine laboratories in the US, Canada, and New Zealand. Join me now as we talk to these two interesting people whose lives were impacted by the Chesapeake Biological Lab. I'm so happy to have with us today, Dr. Vic Kennedy and his wife, Debbie. And what an interesting background you have. Tell me a little bit about some of that behind you. Oh, those are masks from uh, Papua New Guinea and from uh, Africa that we picked up uh, over different uh, times when we were in those countries. So you've done a lot of travel, haven't you? We've been fortunate to do that, yeah, over the years. You told me, I think, in the pre-interview, 60 countries? I think it's 70, 71. That's great. That is just it's great. Since, uh, since then, but I'm, I'm, I may have gotten it wrong then, but I know it's seven. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. About your first, how you met. I, I understand that you met on the CBL campus or in Solomon? Yes, we did. The uh, situation was that uh, I was uh, working with uh, Dr. Joe Mahersky, who uh, was a, a professor at Chesapeake Biological Lab, who was hired by uh, Dr. Gene Cronin, the director of the lab, to carry out a, an important um, survey, study, in the Patuxent River of the effects of a steam electric generating station um, just across, uh, just up from the um, Benedict area. Oh, okay. At a lab across from Benedict on the uh, uh, Calvert County shore called Halloween Point Field Station. And the state was paying him and his uh, uh, colleagues to study the effects of a steam electric generating station um, on the biology of the Patuxent River because a steam electric generating station, in this case, this one was burning coal uh, to heat a river water uh, in um, boilers, so that the river water became steam. The steam went through steam turbines, which rotated and produced electricity. Oh, wow. The um, hot water that, or the steam was recondensed into liquid water and was moved out of the power plant and into a cooling canal before it went into the river. And the question is, all of this hot water going into the river, what is it going to do to the Patuxent River? Sure. Um, oyster beds nearby, would it kill the oysters? Uh, would it send a plume of hot water across the relatively narrow Patuxent River at that point that might uh, hamper striped bass, for example, from swimming upstream to spawn or American eels coming yeah. down from uh, their growing area? So there were these questions about the effects of the steam electric station and the state gave money to Cheswick Biological Lab and to uh, Dr. Mahersky to study this, which he did for about a 10 year period of time. Okay. And he uh, hired me as a biological technician, uh, faculty research assistant at that time, uh, to manage the um, laboratory aspect dealing with temperature effects on uh, the um, survival and respiration of a number of different uh, organisms, including bivalves. And uh, that was good for me because I was going to be able to take uh, those data and go back to the University of Rhode Island, which is where I was doing my PhD. Okay, okay. And in 1964, I went to URI, spent a year taking courses.
courses and thinking about research and I heard about Mahersky's opportunity and um, came down to talk to him and he hired me and I spent three years from 65 through 68 working on that project before I went back up to the University of Rhode Island uh, to finish up my uh, PhD uh, work. I'm going to pause you right there really quick because I think you told me one time that you have heard about the Mazursky opportunity because you were at a scientific conference and sort of networking with other people who told you about it? Well, actually, it was one of the uh, men on my uh, committee. Okay, okay. Who had heard about that. And uh, he told me about it and he knew Joe Mahersky and knew that Joe uh, was a good scientist. So that's how I learned that way. Okay. But then in the process of being down at the uh, Halloween Point Field Station, which is uh, 25 miles north of Solomon's where CBL is, periodically we would go down to CBL to use the library or um, go to meetings. And uh, one of the people I met down there was um, De name? Debbie Coffey. <laughs> and, 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 so, uh, and it was Kismet. <laughs> Isn't it? That was the library in Bevan, in, in Bevan Hall back then? Nice, it was a nice hall in the basement. Okay, okay. And uh, Debbie worked in the basement. She can tell you how she ended up at, at Chesapeake Biological Lab. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, Alice Jane Mansuetti, now Lipson, uh, was the scientific illustrator there. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, she uh, had been widowed just recently to that period of time and uh, had been working at CBL as their illustrator and went, uh, decided to go to Spain for a sabbatical. And she had five children at the time, so her mother was able to go along too. Oh, wow, nice. Through people who knew each other, uh, I got a, a, an offer to just plug in that one year, which was just very nice because I, I was over in Florence studying art and <clears throat> wanted to come back home. <laughs> and figure out what to do next, sort of. And so I, <laughs> living at home with my mother, and she said, oh, it's only one year, you know, it's okay. Find <laughs> out. I was, <laughs> figuring out what I was going to do next. So I was uh, the, the uh, biological illustrator there, which means, <clears throat> which it means working with the scientists and pre-computers in some ways. Oh, wow. A lot of uh, old pictures of various... Uh, drawings and, and different things, scientific. So in the little introduction, we saw some examples of your beautiful work. That kind of thing. And it, it is scientific drawing, but it is art. It, it's yeah. very interesting to me that yeah. it's, it's these creatures and you're drawing the little details, but it's this wonderful piece of art. And well, hers is gorgeous. I always wanted to work with her and I just plugged in and didn't get to be with her. <laughs> I'd like to, because I've always admired her work very much. Yeah. Oh. And of course, before a lot of the stuff, we did a lot of charts and graphs too. So that was sure, the basic sure. stuff. So, you know, Vic would come in and use the use the uh, library, and just uh, instantly, yeah. <laughs> because we were engaged three months after we met, and married oh. seven months after we met. But we were both turning twenty six, and yeah. we. We called Joe our Polish Cupid. <laughs> so where did you go on a date back then in Solomon? <laughs> I remember our first one. I, our first date, I remember very well. We went up to Annapolis to a movie. <laughs> one yeah. doesn't, uh, back then, one yeah. didn't go uh, Anywhere. on dates to Solomon's. <laughs> it was Nothing no trendy then? What was that? It wasn't trendy then? Well, not on that I don't trendy. know if it's trendy now. Uh, <laughs> Solomon's was at the end of the road. And the, the one. <laughs> the bridge did not exist at that time. Mm -hmm. The bridge came in after the uh, power, the nuclear power plant was uh, built. Okay. It, it was put in there so that uh, people from Solomon's wouldn't have to drive past the power plant if there was an accident there. In other words, if there's a power plant somewhere, you have to be able to get away in both right, directions. Right. And so the, the uh, bridge across to... Um, St. Mary's County was constructed apparently for that reason. But at any rate, before that happened, and that happened long after uh, we were there, um, on a Friday night, Solomon shut down, and big, uh, people uh, going on dates would go up to Washington, D.C., or Annapolis, or sure. 
I think the tacky bar was still there. The ticky tacky bar was still there. <laughs> <laughs> now that sounds, oh, interesting. Now some of the buildings that are currently on campus were still there, like Nice Hall and Devon. Yeah, yeah and Corey, there were three, um, three large buildings that form a, a kind of a U shape uh, around the uh, a central quadrangle were there. Okay. I don't think there was much else in the way of uh, places that CBL used. I can't remember, but uh, eventually, of course, it bought us um, the uh, big biological lab and the Center for Environmental Science, of which it's a part, bought up a number of additional uh, homes sure. in the area. And they also built a couple of new big labs, as you know. So, but when we were there, it was uh, just a relatively compact. <laughs> Um, okay. My office was in Cop House, and a yeah. woman came by, an older woman, and she said, may I look around? She said, I lived in this home. My dad was a waterman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really interesting, some of the historic buildings that are on the campus. Yeah. We, we played volleyball at lunchtime in what is now a parking lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, outside the library area. That was, mm -hmm. that was something. Uh, so tell me where you went from CBL now that you're married and you left Calvert County. Well, I, as I said, uh, showed up in uh, 1965 when <clears throat> Joe Mahersky hired me and I worked there for three years, went back in 68. Deb and I got married in, the, uh, in June 68. And um, we went to Rhode Island so that I could continue and finish oh, up mm -hmm. my PhD. So I had two more years there taking courses, comprehensive exams, writing the dissertation, pending it. And so in, in 1970, I got my PhD. You're originally from Canada, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Then where from Rhode Island did you go? Well, it was uh, an interesting, that started us on the uh, kind of trips that allowed us to, <laughs> which is you see behind us. Uh, there's a, there was a program that started in California in the uh, late 50s, early 60s called, um, at that time it was called World Campus Afloat. It's now called the C. And what the idea behind it is that the uh, program has a, a ship, which is actually a, an ocean liner, that they convert to a, a university campus basically by uh, taking some areas of the ship and turning them into classrooms. Oh, and, wow. and so that ship uh, has a semester uh, at sea, fall and spring. And at that time, it was run by uh, Chapman, Uni Chapman College, not Chapman University. And what they would do is they take up to uh, 700 students. 700? 700. Wow. <laughs> when we were on first, the ship was a bit smaller. Uh, it was a former Holland America Line ship. And it only had 500 students. But it uh, took all of these students, and they had about 40 courses that you could take. Uh, history. Um, literature, music, uh, political science, in my case, science. And so at any rate, uh, this program, I hadn't heard of it, but one day in 1970, when I was in the spring of 1970, when I was on campus, um, I saw a man advertising the program to undergraduates at the University of Rhode Island. And uh, I looked at the program and I was all, had always been interested in, in other countries. And I said, uh, do they hire, how do they hire faculty? And says, so you just go ahead and apply. So in the spring of 70, I applied to what was then World Campus Afloat, run by Chapman uh, College, and uh, got hired for that fall. So the fall semester, I was on the ship teaching. In the spring, I was at Chapman College in Orange County, substituting for a man from uh, their faculty who was teaching. And then in the fall of 71, we went back for our second go-round. I was teaching three courses um, in marine biology and, and uh, environmental courses, and Debbie was a librarian. So that's oh, that's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. And we went to um, uh, each. Uh, it's about a hundred days of the semester long. Oh, okay. Twelve or more countries, and uh, the first time we were mostly in Europe, and then Sierra Leone, Africa, and across to. Um, Salvador, Brazil, and through the Panama Canal to um, Los Angeles. 
And the next time we left from um, uh, Los Angeles, we went around the world coming back into New York. So that allowed us to see uh, many, many countries. And we always said at that point in our lives, we said, if we ever have children, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to take them with us? So when our son was 16, a junior in high school, and when our daughter was in college, we were able to take them with us. Oh, that's yes. great. That's, that's great. great. We saw many of the faculty that had done it several times. <laughs> we have what a great uh, vacation, but also a great education. Well, it's a lot of work. It was hardly a vacation for the faculty. For you, yeah, for the kids it was. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, one of the things was we were very sensitive to that idea that uh, this should not be a party ship. And so right, right. requirements that the, the, uh, the courses were university accredited university courses. Sure. Um, each uh, faculty member had to teach three. And uh, the upper limit was about 32 students per course. So, uh, but, and marine biology generally was oversubscribed because you can imagine that people <laughs> going, bet. oh, yeah, I want to take marine biology. <laughs> so, Everybody wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. Absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, I, I had as, as many as 90 students uh, uh, on a semester teaching them the three courses. Um, and so it was supposed to be um, rigorous as much as possible. Of course, mm -hmm. there were balls uh, <laughs> on there, but uh, it was, I thought, pretty good. Yeah. Now, did you do, you had classrooms and laboratories and did you deploy instrumentation into the ocean and that kind of thing? No, we didn't have labs. That was the one shortcoming. Okay. Or was that uh, when we went to different ports, you had to have uh, two or three field, uh, uh, field ships available oh, okay. Okay. in each class. And so in one place, I took them um, snorkeling on coral reefs in Hawaii or in American Samoa. Uh, in other places, uh, we might be able to take them to an aquarium. We were in Cape Town, South Africa, and they have a wonderful aquarium. So I was able to take yeah. my class there to see how aquariums were run from behind the scenes, not just walking through the aquarium. Oh, that would be great. Behind the scenes. And the kids themselves made connections, of course. Oh, yeah. Went back to different schools later, and they had that connection of where they had actually seen where they wanted to what go. What a neat opportunity. Did you have a favorite place to visit back then? No, every, <laughs> every place was great. I love to travel and I always say my favorite place is the next place I go. <laughs> That's basically our, our approach on that. And yeah. uh, it's to travel again someday. Yeah, yeah oh, I hope so. I you, were, you were doing this, were you kind of thinking of, of some kind of faculty position somewhere or a research job somewhere? Well, actually, having gotten my PhD, I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking. I just assumed I'd end up at a university teaching somewhere. <laughs> so, um, when I came back after the fall of 1971, the second voyage, uh, I needed a job and Joe Mahersky came through. He hired me again. <laughs> Point and I worked there. Come back to, to come back to Maryland. <laughs> yeah, and of course Deb's parents uh, lived there in this house in that this we're in house, now. Yeah. Now, now go back to that for a moment. You live in a family home. We yeah we uh, came to Ohio. Uh, my my parents and my sister and I in the fifties. And Dad does, uh, he had a change of jobs. He had been dean of the art academy in Cincinnati. And he left the art world and went back to uh, government work. So he was okay. working. And we were looking for an area. And then mother's parents were building a retirement home here at Scientist Cliffs. And so we came for a visit and we liked the area so much. Mm -hmm. I designed, designed and built this house. And I've always liked this house better than the homes we had in other places. That is so cool. That is so cool. We designed it on one floor with aging in mind and all that. And the yeah. Oh, it's very, very nice to mostly That's, retire. That is so interesting. So you're at Horn Point. Did you decide you stayed there for a while? In, in well, to, get, to get to Horn Point, I had to um, uh, go back to where Joe Mahersky hired me after I'd been on the ship. And I worked for a year as a faculty research assistant. And then I had always, again, been interested in working in uh, different places. And I got a postdoc in New Zealand. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. And so we uh, went to New Zealand for 15 months with our uh, two, two month old daughter. Six. Was she six months then? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh. And uh, we had a really 
uh, find time in uh, New, New Zealand. I'll bet. See there, and then I got another postdoc in Newfoundland, in Canada, and from there Joe Murphy came through again. And he, the <laughs> Hornpoint true. Lab, the Hornpoint Lab, which is a sister lab to the Chesapeake Biological Lab, was just starting up over in Cambridge, Maryland. Oh, okay, okay. And they were looking for faculty, and, and uh, Joe put my name forward, and I was hired as the, um, the assistant professor at the Horn Point Laboratory and was there for 40 years until retiring a few yeah. years ago. We lived in Cambridge and that was only five miles outside of, of, Cambridge. of the campus, yeah. And they have a much bigger campus, but similar work. And, and tell us about your work. Well, your focus was on shellfish? Well, yeah, I, my master's uh, at uh, Newfoundland before I came to, uh, uh, to the States was on uh, a, a fish called winter flounder. But okay. I did in, um, clams and oysters uh, for my PhD at the University of Rhode Island, which is where I, I had been working. And from then on, I basically did most of my work with uh, oysters, had, uh, some work with blue crabs, and a little bit of work with fish. Um, depending upon the um, graduate students that I was involved with and their interests, sure. I managed to get involved with a certain number of these uh, estuarine uh, organisms and um, help study them and find out something about their existence. Yeah, some of our, uh, those of us, uh, those who have joined may not know that the Chesapeake Bay is an estuary. Yes. Mm -hmm. about some of those who are uninformed about what a, an estuary is. Yeah, that would be a situation such as Chesapeake Bay where you've got a river or many rivers coming into it at one end, bringing fresh water, and it connects to the ocean at the other end. And so in between with the uh, fresh water coming in and with the sea washing back and forth at uh, the uh, bottom end, there's a mixing of um, water uh, back and forth so that it's a uh, lower salinity than the ocean and a higher salinity than the, than the river. So it's an estuary, brackish water, and the organisms have to be adapted to that sort of uh, a habitat. And they have very interesting adaptations and it's also an area which is uh, very productive. Um, for instance, the oysters and fish in the uh, bay were very, very important 100 years ago to the, shell, uh, to the seafood industry. I've seen pictures where the oyster shells are piled above a roof of a building. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think? I know some of your books have focused on some of the changes and the depletion of our resources there. Well, we've done what people have done all around the world, and that is overfish <laughs> and modify the habitat so that it's no longer as suitable for <clears throat> the different creatures as it was in the past. So there's been a big change. And does climate change affect those populations too? Like the first year I moved here, people said that it rained so much, it changed the salinity of the water and the oysters were not as plentiful. Well, it, it's a complex situation. It, if there is a big increase in, in uh, rainfall, of course, that does have an effect on the salinity okay. uh, of the bay, and that can affect oysters at the upper area towards where the uh, rivers are coming in. Uh, it can have an effect on oysters. They don't do as well in terms of feeding or uh, spawning under real low salinity conditions. Um, the bigger concern in my mind with regard to climate change with these animals is temperature. Because as, they, uh, as the temperatures go up, for instance, as a uh, clam that uh, I've been uh, studying and working with someday on called the soft shell clam. It's the one that a uh, steamer clam that you can buy in the, in the stores. And if you're in New England, you have clam bakes and it's one. Right. Of the <laughs> you're making me hungry. <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, uh, we, we studied this uh, back when I was working with Joe Mahersky, found that it had a, a lower tolerance for higher temperatures. Oh, five valves in the bay, and so we uh, we made a prediction back uh, in the um, 1970s that high temperatures have a negative effect. High temperatures from power plants, okay, okay. negative effect. But now thinking about now, high temperatures from uh, climate change are probably going to stress it, and it's at a southern limit of distribution as it is, and so it may very well be that Chesapeake Bay loses its population of soft shell clams. Uh, so that's a concern about climate change affecting uh, 
uh, animals and plants that are not right. covered at higher temperatures. The, other, the third thing, of course, is sea level rise, which is going to affect yes. you. Yeah, the sea level rise is a concern for all these cities and towns that are on the coast. Could be. Mm -hmm. Little islands that have disappeared, I've read about. It's, uh, yeah, they have, and Solomon's has got a problem because uh, you get some of these tides and uh, it, it covers some of the of the water, uh, some of the roadways. Yeah. And CBL actually is not in a very good position uh, for that because it's right at the edge of the water. Well, sometimes is, you'll see that flooding on whatever that street is near the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know what you mean, yeah. So that climate change is going to be a, a problem in the area, um, not only here, but elsewhere. It's interesting to me how many, uh, there are some simple solutions like changing your, your uh, going from a hardscape to a different landscape for your coastal property and that kind of thing, that some of those things can make a difference. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, short term, I guess. Yeah, we're not being sensible enough uh, to... <laughs> Um, fossil fuels the way we should. Uh, now we keep dumping uh, the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We're in a situation now where the, it's going to be very difficult, even if you stop doing, getting all of the, the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, temperatures are still going to go up. We'll be dealing with this um, long past when all that's here are, are uh, long gone. So what brought you back to Calvert County? I retired from uh, the Horn Point Laboratory okay. and uh, Debbie's parents had died and left the house to her. So we, we, we had um, uh, renovated it and uh, that was a few years before we, I, re I retired. Okay. We retired, we moved over here because of course the house was ready for us and this was where Debbie more or less grew up as a teenager. The kid talked about <clears throat> moving to Canada, um, retire, but then he decided Maryland is a pretty good state to be in. Yeah, it is. And, you know, he had all his connections here and everything, too. So but I used to live in the West where it snowed all the time and, and mm. joke that when it rains here, you don't have to shovel it. <laughs> you get a little tired of the rain, but that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do, too. You've been busy since you've been here. I told uh, talked to a friend the other day who's retired, and he said he's busier than he was when he was working full time. Do you find that? Well, <laughs> I haven't changed what I do. I don't have a lot of. I'm not a woodworker. I'm not a cabinet maker. I don't sail. I don't play golf. So, <laughs> but you're an editor and a writer. I'm sure that keeps yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, that's the thing. That, that's what I enjoy doing is mm -hmm. just in, in editing books and so on. So. Um, I am busy for that reason, and if it wasn't, I'd be bored out of my skull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, are you still doing some artwork and keeping busy with that? Yeah, I do miss people. I'm much more gregarious yes. <laughs> than I would be happy in a little room somewhere, which is. Yeah, this, this year has been an unusual one for sure. Now, mm -hmm. it's but, like you had a book that came out just a year ago, two, two years ago? Shifting Basics. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had, I had two books that came out. Oh, okay. There's a coincidence, but uh, one of them is uh, a, a friend of mine uh, is an, uh, has spent 30 years studying diamondback terrapins, which everybody in Maryland yes. knows. Um, and the terrapins, he was studying them. And after I had uh, co-edited a book on oysters and on blue crabs, I thought, well, I'll do one on the terrapins because those are three <laughs> iconic uh, Maryland or Chesapeake Bay. Certainly, yeah. And so he and I uh, got together and we had a number of people writing chapters and so on. And Johns Hopkins University Press uh, published that, uh, Ecology and Conservation of the Diamondback Turban. But at the same time, I, I had been working on this um, situation that I, I said earlier about the fact that the Bay used to be extremely productive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very uh, good for uh, the seafood industry. In yeah. other words, there were yeah. millions, millions of bushels of oysters, there were shad, uh, there were um, a variety of other species that were harvested back in the 1880s that supported uh, tremendous industries of thousands of people. Yeah. And that has gone down. So I was looking into that over time and I pulled it together in a book that uh, came out also by Johns Hopkins University Press 
dealing with the changes in um, the natural resources in the bay. So yeah, those two, I think they, they came out two years ago. I find it interesting that you're focusing on things we eat. So <laughs> Vital skills. Well, that's yeah. No, the terrapins are very interesting to me. Uh, I've had an opportunity to learn quite a bit about those while I've been at CBL, that they are an indicator species and that climate mm. is really affecting them and, and how they nest. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nest is so important to even what sex they are. Well, this is, it goes back to the um, sea level rise concern. Uh, because of the uh, slow rise in sea level here, people who own property have been losing it to erosion. And so one of the impulses is to dump rock, uh, rip rock, what we call it, uh, on the shore to keep the uh, erosion from happening. And so you've got this rock, but the problem with that is it covers the beach that the female terrapins used to and uh, lay their eggs. Right, covers up that nesting site. So the nesting site is not there. That's all part of this um, aspect that I was pointing out in the book I wrote, is that not only did we over harvest, take too many um, crabs and oysters and shad and terrapins out of the system, we also damaged the environment right. that they live in so that it's hard for them to recoup their numbers. And so this is one of the things that's going on if uh, we, armor our shoreline, which is what you call this business of dropping uh, boulders on the shore to keep it from eroding, uh, the terrapins are going to be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. But fortunately, and this is my friend, Willem Rosenberg, that I co-edited this book with, with, he's been studying Poplar Island, which is an area in the bay where they've been dumping um, dredge spoil from Baltimore Harbor and so on, right. building the island back up. And that is a place where there are these soft sediment beaches and the terrapins are doing very well there. I've seen video of that. Uh, I'm a birder and so I, I see some of these uh, man-made islands that have really become lovely habitat for mm. species. Yes, that's, a, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So what keeps you busy when it's not pandemic days? You have yeah. <laughs> writing and, and Debbie's painting and... Well, Deb paints, yeah. You, you, you have two children that are, do they live in the U.S. or do they live in Canada? They're in Canada. Okay. The border's closed at the moment. <laughs> yeah, so I know you've missed them terribly this year. Well, thanks to Zoom. Yeah, we've enjoyed it. Yeah, them. that's been good. Now, did they become scientists or, or uh, are they? No, our, our daughter uh, got a master's in uh, uh, public health administration. Okay. So working with hospital, a hospital situation up. Uh, it's, it's near Ottawa. Okay. And our son uh, took a, a film studies degree um, and got a master's uh, from a California university uh, in film studies. And he's now, he's now working uh, in Toronto uh, with independent film makers. So How interesting. Neither one of them became scientists and neither one of them became painters, although <laughs> Christopher, Christopher is an artist in using film. Sure, absolutely. And you have grandchildren that I know you miss, but you see them on Zoom. That's kind of what we're doing, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that works out well. So I know you're missing travel, too. Where's the place you haven't been that you'd like to go? <laughs> oh, Jeepers, Easter Island, uh, Madagascar. Um, those were two of the ones. I'd go back to um, the Bhutan, uh, north of India, if I could. It's a wonderful place. Oh, interesting. I'm Paris. Yeah, Paris, yeah. Paris. In there, though. <laughs> I, I, she would go back to places she's been to before. I tend not to, um, to want to go back to a place I've been before. That's why Bhutan is so unusual, because I would go back. But no, we're getting to the point we're not going to be able to do uh, as much um, I, I, you know, off the beaten track exploration, but I still go see interesting places. Yeah. I, I am torn. There are some places I would go back to, but like you, I, I'm kind of into going somewhere new. Mm -hmm. that's, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been such fun to visit. Deb? I miss museums and things like that. that you yes, can... theater. Yeah. The... We thought we'd see a lot more of Washington, and we've not been up there even yes. that much. It's just a hassle to get there. Yeah. Oh, it's, um, it's been an, an unusual year, I, and I... I feel like there's some optimism now, so yeah. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, and that may just be my personality. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I think it's, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, we don't have the kind of flu that we had in 1918. Uh, black, the Black Plague has been <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're very bad. And then science kicks in and we sometimes make decent decisions about <laughs> other factors. So eventually it, it, it will get better. Yeah, yeah. It's been such fun. Thank you both so much for joining us. And I think that it's so important that we learn a little bit about the heritage at CBL and some of the people like you who helped make CBL what it is now. Thank you so much for your time. Glad to be here. <laughs>